March 14, 2012, my son Thomas lost his battle with the disease of addiction. I now belong to a club that no parent should ever belong to. Do you know the signs? Do you know the trends that children are doing in today's world? Do you know the signs and symptoms? Do you know the signs and symptoms of drug abuse? I want to empower and educate Long Islanders by bringing a force of professionals. And how to prevent the disease of addiction. Of Long Island in Crisis. Good evening and welcome to Long Island in Crisis. I know that the past two weeks have been uh, a recording with uh, the Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse, uh, which was an incredible show. And Rob Kent and Peggy Bonneau and Dr. Charlie Morgan can't thank them enough. And if you haven't seen that show, I encourage you to watch that show to make sure you know what your rights are as New York State residents and never stop trying to get your loved one help. My special guest tonight is Claudia Ragney from KPC, Kenneth Peters Center for Recovery. And I would like to talk tonight, you know, for those that don't know, I lost my son on March 14, 2012. So we're coming up to that anniversary date. And all of this makes no difference in my life. And there are a lot of people that fight for everyone. And it's not making a difference in our life. We've already joined a club that nobody should belong to. So I am going to be calling on everybody that watches to come out and stand up for your rights and call your legislators and make sure that we get money in the budget this year for certain items. So, Claudia, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you look you gorgeous. Thank you for having me. And I want to talk about, because I do believe you have enough years experience, although you're only One 27. Yeah, well, it's true. That family services used to be part of the equation. Yes. Most, when I started in this field um, in 1982, 1982, I believe it was, we had, that was the... That was the standard model of treatment. Everybody went inpatient. There really was no such thing as outpatient. And rehabs expected families to go out there for a week, stay on site, and go through a week of treatment. That was standard protocol for the Karen Foundation, for Hazleton, for the old-time Minnesota model programs like Twin Town. That was standard. But over the years, as insurance and managed care hit, and insurance companies not being willing to pay for family treatment and the margins getting less and less, treatment centers had to eliminate this unbelievably powerful, effective treatment. And it's a tragedy. You know, I, I can see not going out perhaps for a week, but not giving the family also treatment for everyone to work through and creating the, a different environment for the loved ones struggling with the disease to come home to is just a recipe for failure. Absolutely. A Absolutely. continuing recipe for failure. And in their wisdom, mom and dad trying to take care of their loved one or uh, one parent trying to care for the children and dealing with another spouse the other person is going to get sick. Yes. High blood pressure, mm -hmm. you know, ulcers, whatever it is, is going to manifest itself physically. Statistics, Metropolitan Life um, used to be a big health insurer back in the 90s. And they did a study that showed the families of alcoholics had a five times utilization rate of health care services than families of non-alcoholics. Five times. Five times. And that was a study done by Metropolitan Life. 
To me, it's a no-brainer. It is treat a no the family. It's treat cost the family. effective. It is cost effective, and treat them at mm. the earliest intervention that we can get. Absolutely, because we're going to have problem, a different outcome. Absolutely, because part of the outcome, you can't get the patient sick uh, well and then send them back to a sick environment. Absolutely. For instance, I had a, a session the other day with a young young girl who was looking to come back into my program. And, and your program? My program is, is an intensive, intensive outpatient. outpatient. Okay. Okay, she wanted to come back in. And we're obviously very limited as to what you can do in outpatient. So I brought the mom in to try and find out what's the home environment like. Well, there were two children, an 18-year-old, a 20-year-old. The 20-year-old is the identified patient who wants to come into my program. The 18-year-old is drinking and smoking pot. And that's okay with the mom because that kid hasn't done heroin. See, the heroin, is, that's, the is, problem. Is, that's the problem. So I'm trying to, to get this mom to understand there needs to be a recovery house. That yes. it's not okay, that the son's drug is okay, and the daughter's drug is not okay. Right. That this needs to be a recovery house, and that it's more likely than not that the son is going to end up starting to play with pain pills, if he hasn't already, and end up on heroin. Right. It's just a natural progression of what's going on with kids on Long Island. So at KPC, if you're 25 and under, okay. I mandate family treatment. I will not accept a, a young adult into my program unless the family comes. And we do what we can, you know, in... We see the families four and a half hours a week. We do the best we can. Right. Four and a half hours. But they're very resistant to change. They want to just point the finger at the addict and say that's the problem. But, you know, the whole family needs to change and needs to understand that this is a disease. It's not a character defect. Um, and that once the addict or alcoholic gets sober, all the house problems aren't going to go away. Dr. Jeff Reynolds was here right before the holidays, and we were talking about this. And, and I came to your facility before, right before Thanksgiving. You sure did. But um, Jeff put, put it so eloquently also. His young son is, has a severe yes. nut allergy. Mm -hmm. He likes peanut butter. He doesn't bring it into the house because it can kill his son. No brainer. Enough said. No, it's no brainer. So if there's a loved one in your house that struggles with the disease of addiction, alcohol, substances, you lock your pain medication up, you lock mm -hmm. other things up, lock your alcohol up, and it needs to be a safe environment for everyone. That's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice is waking up every morning saying, did that really happen? Is my son dead? That's right. a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. And not drinking in your home is not a sacrifice. And when you came into my facility and we kind of really kind of, you laid it out for the parents. Yes. What needs to be done. As a matter of fact, the, the family I met with yesterday was happened to be there that day. Ah. After everything that was said, still couldn't grasp the concept of having a drug and alcohol-free alcohol house. Now, I understand not everybody has a problem. Correct. But there, as you said, you make sacrifices for the ones you love. And like Dr. Reynolds isn't fighting for his right to eat peanut butter. No. Why do the, my families fight so hard for their right to continue to drink and smoke pot? It, it baffles me. It really does baffle me because there's no logical no, they reason said, and for I, it. And I thought when he said that, I was like, perfectly said. You know, if someone in your house is struggling with, uh, you know, obesity... Wouldn't the family be kind enough to n not have snacks at home? Of course. Of course. When my husband decided, we were both cigarette smokers oh, two and a half decades ago, when he wanted to quit smoking, I quit to support him. The funny thing is I stayed quit. He started smoking again, and I stayed quit. But that's what you do to support your loved, your loved one. ones. Right. My son, my younger son, wrestler. From November through the end of February, there was no food in my house. <laughs> it wasn't happy. 
but I didn't bring things in and eat in front of him because why am I going to torment him? Right, exactly. And that's all it is, is torment. I can eat snacks, you know, or have a big lunch and come home and, and support him in his effort to succeed at something. So why do you think that families fight so hard? I, to continue to drink I and think, drug when they they do these are not identified addicts and alcoholics these families, correct? You know I know them I've I've spent time with them I mean they are not, it's not that they're addicted, so they are they have the compulsion to use these are basically social drinkers. They want to come home and have a and, glass of wine with dinner right. or anything like that, and I'm not against that. Nobody's trying to be the police on any of these things. Take all the alcohol lock it up, or get rid of it all, and bring home, if you want to have wine with dinner, bring it home. When you finish whatever it is you're going to finish, lock it up or dump it out. Mm -hmm. Or do it when they're going to be at a meeting. When they're not going to be around. Or treat yourselves and go out to dinner and right. have a glass of wine with dinner or a drink or exactly. whatever it is that you want. It, the person struggling with the disease is not trying to punish the family either. It's not at all. And the, actually, our patients say, no, 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 I don't, wanna, I don't want my problem to be their problem. It's okay if they drink. But then in private, they tell us it's a huge trigger. And the reality is, if I'm an alcoholic and an addict and you're not, I'm in early recovery, let's say the first year, and you're my sister, um, and you're drinking a glass of wine, I know I can't. What's happened? Oh, I'm smiling, but inside I am angry, I am resentful, I am jealous. Jealous. And it's bringing I think that's up. That's probably oh, it's, the biggest. That's the key. Yeah. And it's bringing up this mm, and anger. The, resent, the anger and the resentment. And, um, and more often than not, then they go the next step with the heck with it. Or it, it is a disease of the brain. So it is. The brain will say, you know, you never had a problem with alcohol. That's right. That okay wasn't your drink. problem. Right. And all those roads will take you right back down the wrong road. Mm -hmm. It happens over all and over and over again. You know, the, the miraculous wisdom of the 12 steps in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous rings true in, in everything. And uh, in, in recovery, it's really quite, quite di divinely inspired. And um, they talk about this a lot, you know, in the big book, about not walking into the lion's cage if you're not a lion tamer. Um, you know, it's about exactly. changing people, places, and things. And sometimes family members need to leave their home to get clean and sober because the family can't support them. And, and that's they, a tragedy. And they can't come back. And they can't come back. Because it's not a healthy environment. Yeah. And that's sad. We had, I just found out on the way here, uh, a young man who went through my program a number of years ago, had over two years clean and sober, about two years and six months, was sponsoring kids, had a relapse this past weekend behind mm -hmm. a broken relationship, and he died. They pulled the plug. He was on life support, and they pulled the plug today. These are the tragedies you might not hear about in the papers, you know, yeah. not the identified, they found, you know, found him dead, but this is as a result of an overdose. Um, five days later, they pulled the plug. And, Heartbreaking. Uh, I'm just tired. I'm tired of our kids dying, Yeah. you know, and um, if there's anything that we can do to continue to educate families and that's on really, how I, to support their loved ones and not I didn't enable. have the education either no. going through it. I didn't have a road map. I didn't know what was going on. By the grace of, you know, I, I, I decided things every single day. At the, I did the best I could in the moment of time that yeah. I was. That's why so many people try to bring this forward now, families in support of treatment, yes. everything, to try to educate families so you don't feel isolated, you don't feel alone, and the best and biggest gift you can give yourself is to understand what your loved one is going through. Exactly. Not to 
condone it, not to anything, but to give yourself your own toolbox to draw from so you, you know how to deal with one another. That's right. We don't condone it. We don't condemn it. But there are things you can do very, very wrong, as, as we know, enabling. enabling. We can enable our addicts and alcoholics to death. Um, and that's a tragedy when you see that happen. You know, um, a singular relapse after two and a half years sober. Um, Shouldn't kill you. It's, it, but it does. But it does. But it does. And but this is does. the second young, young adult that I've known that achieved a number of years and died with a very small amount, a very small relapse. Yeah. You know, um, so you don't know. We really don't know if you, if, you, know, if you have another drink or a drug. You know. what, what is it going to do? Yeah. We're going we're gonna to pick up with that in one moment. We'll be right back after this message. Welcome to the Rehab Center located at 2025 Brentwood Road in Brentwood, New York. At the center, we offer chiropractic services, acupuncture, and physical therapy. We take most major medical, no fault, and workers' comp insurance. If you need these types of services, contact the offices at 631-234-4949. That's Tatiana, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from heroin addiction. It was really, really hard, waking up in the morning, not knowing what to do, needing my next bag. I was so lost, but I'm here today to tell you that there is a solution. When I was in my active addiction, I didn't realize that there was another way of life. I thought that that was the only way, because it felt so good to get high, but it was all an illusion, and I didn't realize that. But today, being four years clean and sober, my life is absolutely amazing. I'm able to travel. I don't need a drink. I don't need a drug. I'm just happy being with myself. I couldn't understand for many years why. Why was I doing this? It's because I was an addict, but I didn't know it. Today, many kids are becoming addicted to drugs and alcohol, but they don't know exactly what they're getting into until they're out of it. And it's our job, it's my job, to stand for these kids, stand for their recovery, and fight for their addiction. So I'm the president of Onward Forever, and I provide recovery services and support. And we're here to help. We're here to just listen. Anything that we can do to help. If you need me, this is how you get a hold of me. Please call 347-244-1550. 347-244-1550. I developed this company to help you, our families, and our community to fight this crisis on Long Island and in our nation. Thank you. Welcome back to Long Island in Crisis. And, you know, we always say Long Island in Crisis. It's America in Crisis, without a doubt. And every tomorrow morning, I don't know how many thousands of people will wake up without a loved one. Without a loved one. Well, we know roughly one a day, a pa you know, a parent every morning wakes up and having to make funeral arrangements for their child. That's just yeah. Nassau and Suffolk County. Yeah. You know, it, it's just, and it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. It's beyond heartbreaking. It, and every week I say this, it's not, we hear about the deaths. We don't hear about every death. There are also children on life support. There's children on life support. There are overdoses where they survive, but now they're brain damaged. Yeah. I've got several of them yeah. in my program where they're permanently brain damaged because they were... Um, without oxygen for more time than was safe. Yeah. And this is it. That's what they got to live with the rest of their life. That's what the person 
that suffered the overdose, but the family now. Yes. You know, all those hopes and dreams that you have for your children goes away by something that doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen. And we as doesn't a, have to happen. As a community, we need to stand up. We need to say enough is enough. We're going to do something. I mean, we had, what, two cases of Ebola and billions of dollars was thrown at it. What is this? And now Z the, Zika, the Zika, <laughs> Zika virus. Zika, Zika and virus. that's like three billion is being thrown it's at being it. It's being thrown at it. And meanwhile, there are... 1,500,000 arrests per year for DWI. And every DWI, the statistics say, for every arrest, there have been 87 times that person drove drunk. So there's roughly 300 million people a year driving drunk on the roads. And those accidents kill people, maim people. Kill, kill families. Exactly. You know. Now we've got the drugs added to that. We are losing huge chunks well, of our population. You know, if, if we look at the headlines for today, how many cars drive into buildings? If anyone thinks that, that they misstepped their foot, they're just right. stupid. Right. Yeah, absolutely. How many bank robberies? How many These robberies are, are going on right now? Constantly. And it's, Home invasions. That's all drug-seeking. All drug-related. And the best example, you know, my son was kidnapped. His brain was kidnapped. Heroin was his, his boss yeah. and his best friend and told him what to do. He did things that he never would have done clean and sober, period. Absolutely. I see young girls who prostitute themselves. Six months. I mean, six, within six months, they are prostituting themselves for a bag of dope. These yeah. kids, they have, we all have our moral boundaries as we grow up. What we're willing to do, we're not. And what heroin does, it forces these kids to push out their boundary line. So oh, they, they snort the heroin. I'll never shoot. Well, then they smoke it, and within a few months, they're shooting it. Yeah. Then, oh, I mean, I'd never, you know, have I'd sex never for steal. drugs. I'd never steal. They've all stolen jewelry from their families, um, friends. You know, I'd, I'd never have sex for drugs. They have sex for drugs. You know, um, young men having sex with other men to get their drugs to do. So what's happening is their moral compass is, getting, is spinning out of control. And by the time they come into treatment, this heroin has stolen their soul. Yes. They're really, they're, they're PTSD in a very short period of time. Yes. And if we had... And, and you and I were at a, at a conference recently where this analogy was used. If there was a black van driving around a neighborhood, kidnapping kids, you better believe that every parent would be up in arms on the stairs of City Hall saying, this has got to stop now. But that black van is heroin. And black it's trend, kidnapping it, our it's children. It's addiction, period. It's addiction. Just addiction. That's true. It's addiction. And it's, this isn't a joke. This smoking pot isn't safe. No. You know, that's another, you know, the parents think as long as my kid is drinking and smoking pot. But Kim Lauby, who was our prevention yes. expert, always a, a, addiction is an, is an adolescent disease. So if we can keep kids long enough from a substance, that's right. from putting a, you know, a substance, any kind of substance in their body, the longer that we can have them come to the age of majority or 25. ideally 25. Yes, 25. And you see... They may never struggle. Can, that's right. With and the disease of addiction. That's absolutely so right. the car rental companies get it correct at age 25. Certainly to drink now is age 21. It should be 25. It should be 25. I think but it should it's be 25. Not. But I would take 21. Mm -hmm. I would take 21 because I think... That would cut the odds dramatically. You know, so why is it that parents are so willing to say, I'd love to know the answer to that. I, me too. And, and I really I would. spend a lot of time, as have you, talking to parents. And none of them, in my 30-odd years of doing this work, I have never had a family give me an answer that made any sense. You know, drinking 
drinking is at home is safer than drinking out. No, it's not. The same amount of brain damage is occurring. So wherever you're ingesting the alcohol, it's harming your child's brain permanently and irrevocably. Yes. Um, you're, you're killing trees. You know, so, so as parents, we also want them to get the best grades, have, you know, scholarship opportunities, have, uh, you know, athletic opportunities if that's the, the path that they've chosen. If drinking negates two weeks of, high, of peak performance training. Mm -hmm. So if you're an athlete, you go out Friday night and you're drinking, that, that goes away. So why is it that you're okay with, you know, kids that are high on alcohol, pot, or any kind of substance aren't going to test well? Mm -hmm. Well, the caveat is then the parents give them Adderall so they can test well. And that just adds another layer you know, and, and to the complicated I, I guess, addiction it, picture. And you and I have spoken. I mean, society, everything is a pill to fix everything. Magic bullet. We have a magic bullet yeah. thought process in, our, in the United States. You know, we, we just giggling with my brothers, too. You know, it, your bone could be hanging, sticking through your thigh. <laughs> and my father would put a Band-Aid with Boilies ointment on it, it and say... Well, maybe before you go to bed, we'll give you an aspirin. Sure. You just didn't, you weren't given medicine when you were young. Okay. I wasn't. I wasn't either. I fell off a horse. and Actually, I was thrown from a horse, and I broke two ribs. And I remember my parents driving me home, and I'm, of course, um, a woman on and a grown in. And I said, I said, Dad, I can't breathe deep. You know, I, no, it hurts when I breathe deep. He says, then don't breathe deep. <laughs> That was the answer. <laughs> you know, there was no take, you know, yeah, no, taking was, me to the gonna, emergency right. room and getting 90 Oxycontin. No. And you know what? I survived. You it do survive. It wasn't barbaric. No. It really wasn't barbaric in hindsight. I was sore. They put ice on it. They put heat on it. I survived. Yeah. Um, you know, right now, it's so common, you know, for a root canal, which is a pretty common procedure, can be dealt with very nicely with Novocaine and maybe in the leave afterward. Well, you're getting 25 Percocet. Yeah. Unnecessary. 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 Well, dental schools just added uh, addiction or d proper prescribing to dental schools. So that's Excellent. a good thing. Excellent. I don't know when that goes into effect, but things are starting to change, but they're not changing fast enough. They're not changing And they're not changing enough. broad enough. They really aren't. Uh, if this was, you know, the Zika vaccine, and, and a good friend of ours who is a very well-renowned physician told me that that's a benign virus. Yes. So, you know, makes me cynical to think, what are they doing with this $3 billion that they've now allocated towards this? And we can, we can you know, that's a whole other discussion It's a whole other discussion, but my experience... My opinion, and it's strictly that an opinion, is when they allocate money like that, so they, so they allocate, what, $3 billion in federal aid. It'll be divided amongst 50 states um, and Puerto Rico and wherever. And then by the time it goes through the different layers of administration, there'll be $2.47 that lands at actual treatment. Yeah. You know, um, and it's disturbing. I mean, we're closing down state-run rehabs when we need it most. Yes. Um, the budget cuts. I mean, in the past 10 years, we had a wonderful rehab in Plainview. It was shut down about 10 years ago. Um, the, the rehab in Brentwood has just been, the beds have been cut in half. There was one in Queens, Creedmoor. They shut that down. So they just have detox beds. And we're also talking about at a time when you know, mental illness and all the patients that suffer with mental illness are also being released They're into being the released public. They're being released to community supports that don't exist. Correct. And that's the frightening thing. They go, okay, well, these, these mentally ill patients need to be socialized. They need to be living in the community Yes, with and they supports. need to be supervised. And they need to be supervised, but we don't have the money to supervise them. 
And I think that's why we're seeing an elevation in just these bizarre things like the stabbings in the subway. The, the, and the slashings. And the, the slashings, yeah. This is, it's dangerous stuff. It, it, it is. And I don't know what the answer is. And, I don't and that's know. not bad people. That's just sick people. Sick people. That's really all. sick people that should not be out on the streets. Right. You know, and that's, and that's just another... And if they need to be on meds, most of these sick people function fairly well on meds, but they don't take their meds because they take the meds, they feel better, there's a sense but they're of also cured, mentally and then they stop Ill, taking. So they, right. they're not cognizant enough to... They need to be in community homes, socialize yes. them in community homes, group living, et cetera, put them into workshops, and it, it's worked well. And we had a really good system a number of years back, and it's just being dismantled. And uh, it's frightening. To me, it's it is, frightening. It is frightening. You know, I want to talk about uh, insurance companies. And we're going to talk about insurance favorite. companies right after this message. Galaxy Luxury Coach is a full-service limousine and party bus company. Family owned and operated, we are an industry leader with over 25 years of experience in providing best in class luxury transportation for your special event. Whether it's your precious wedding day, an all day wine tour out east, your high school prom, that special birthday, or just an amazing night on the town, our professional chauffeurs stand ready to ensure your special event is truly special. Galaxy Luxury Coach has one of the largest and modern party bus fleets in the New York area. Our party buses are simply nightclubs on wheels. Concert sound systems, light shows, lasers and strobes, multicolor LED lighting brilliantly lights your party bus inside and out. For corporate and more laid back events, we will cater to your specific needs and requests. What sets Galaxy aside from all others in the luxury transportation industry is our attention to detail in customizing our services to your special event. At Galaxy, it's all about you and your guests. Galaxy customers return time and time again because they know they can trust Galaxy to help deliver those lifetime memorable moments. Step aboard and let your Galaxy experience begin. What are you looking for? You don't even know that. You don't even know that. You can't even answer. I'm asking you about it. You gotta be highly skilled. You gotta be highly skilled. You understand that? Are you well versed there? Are you very smart man? Hit me with some funny shit. My shit is twisted. Tell me something. Tell me what something. What do you have right there? That's awesome. Well, that's a big. That's nice. You know damn well. You know damn well. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Sir. Hey, are you interested? Are you interested in that? Your fire? Your fire? Your fire? Your fire? I see you guys. I see you guys. You see what I'm saying? You understand me? And if you can't whip out answers like that, that man is liable to door a commercial break, punch your fucking mouth loose. You understand me? Time is up, sir. You understand me? You're on. You're you're the man. All right. Give me your name now. I'm sorry. My name is Willie. Willie, where you working at? We are twisted. We are awesome. We are awesome. Love it. Awesome. Love it. Awesome. Can you repeat that question again? Yeah. Question again. Welcome back to Long Island, in Long Island in Crisis. So, again, so my favorite subject, access to treatment. Yes. Insurance companies and them not paying for appropriate level of treatment at the appropriate level of, the, at the appropriate time, all leads everybody down this really bad path. Because when the window opens for someone struggling. We got to get them in. And it also closes real quick. Very quickly. So John Haley was here, and he's, you know, John from Seafield. I do. And we were talking about insurance companies. And unfortunately, the insurance companies will say in their outside voices, you know, years ago when you worked for, say, New York Telephone Company, you would be there for 40 years. Well, people don't work jobs like that anymore. So they're not typically with the same insurance company for a very long period of time. So if ABC Insurance Company keeps saying no to me, event they know actuarially mm -hmm. a certain percentage of their uh, insureds are not going to be with them, so they will push them off to another Makes company's problem. You know, passing the buck, passing the buck, passing the buck. However, by passing the buck with the disease of addiction, we're ending up with a lot of 
dead yeah. children, yes, including my yes, son. And the you other know. piece, too, is because insurance has gone up you know, double, di double yes. digit percentages every year, companies change insurance companies yes. a lot. So you're right. I think that makes a lot of sense that the insurance companies, with their denials, actuarily, st the statistical probability yes. of a, these people being their, their customer in six months is, maybe, what, 50%? Maybe? I don't know. I don't but, know what the percentage is. But it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And the bottom line is it's on the backs of, um, of dead kids, yeah. which isn't good. Dead adults. It's dead not adults. okay. And when you're taking a look at the double-digit millions in salaries and double-digit millions in bonuses that these executives get and double-digit billions in profits, I'm having a hard time. Because we're nobody's. I'm not saying they shouldn't make a profit, but how entitled. much is enough? When is enough enough? And and when is a company ever um, socially responsible? I mean, somehow, some way, there should be some level. If you are a company that's providing health care or managing health care. My belief is there should be a certain level of social responsibility and we shouldn't have to legislate you to be socially responsible. And that means providing the appropriate level of care when it's needed. And when I started in this field in, in 82, heroin addicts went inpatient for 12 to 18 months and it was paid for by the state or by Medicaid. And patients got well. They got well. Right. They got well. Now, I have an IOP program. I think I've got a phenomenally good, structured, sound IOP program. But the insurance companies are asking me to do in 18 IOP sessions. So what, that's one a visit. 18 visits. In 18 visits. How many hours is a visit? Three hours. Three hours. And what they're telling me, that's enough rehab for a heroin addict. Are you kidding? Right. If the patient's coming five times a week, that's three and a half weeks. If you stretch it to three times a week, that's six weeks. With the heroin addict, the way heroin hijacks the brain, you, you, the patient doesn't start thinking clearly enough to be able to internalize the concepts we present in six weeks. It, it's, it's outrageous. And they're denying inpatient treatment. They need inpatient treatment. Um, and I believe, I absolutely believe, if treatment were done right the first time, the relapse rate would go down significantly. I think anyone under 25 needs a minimum of 45 days inpatient. Without a doubt. That's the amount of time it takes a young adult to kind of shift. It's an... That just, if, that's the science. That's the science of young adults. It takes them about 45 days, so a minimum of 45 days. Then step them down to an intensive program five days a week. And offer them a sober living. And sober living, absolutely. You know, that, that, that should be also part of their yes. care, that someone doesn't also have to then come up with rent. Right. Now, you know? the other piece is in if you are... I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but if you get Medicaid, okay, your insurance pays for sober living. But if you are working and have commercial insurance, your insurance won't pay for sober living. To me, that is a real unfair disparity. It is. It is because unfair. whether you're on Medicaid or you're on private commercial insurance, the bottom line is that the issue is the same. Why does this population get services paid for that this population can't when the clinical picture is identical? So we've got to bridge that divide in yes. terms of services that are offered. Um, you know, I don't take Medicaid at my facility. Um, but if I had a sober house attached, insurance wouldn't pay for my sober house. No, and, and they the will sad pay. fact is that Medicaid hasn't changed their rates for sober living in, I don't know, 15 years. Or... I know, and I, I think there's a law out there trying to get that moved up to a reasonable rate. A reasonable rate. Yeah. Reason I do remember John Haley yes. talking about that. Um, 
and that should be. It should Absolutely. be because you can't run a good, safe, sane house for no money. It costs a lot of money on Long Island for taxes, yes. for maintenance, for electric, for everything. Yeah, for everything. We're the highest. It costs the highest cost of living in the but country. The, but the benefit far outweighs right. that immediate cost. That's right. The societal cost of them going through relapse again and again and again. That's right. Their families suffering health wise. So, you know, if, if insurance companies, they all should be building in a wellness model. A wellness model should also be training pediatricians to, uh, you know, teach their young patients about healthy choices. Right. And also how to recognize the disease and perhaps be running tests much earlier on younger adults to see if they are experimenting with Absolutely. anything. Absolutely. You know, and if an insurance company pays for prescriptions for painkillers from a dentist, from a doctor, from whoever, then they should also be held accountable for if that prescription turns that patient into, into an right. Absolutely. Up. And not expect that patient to do it in seven visits and call it a day. Nothing solved in seven no. visits. You know, Workman's Comp Compensation Board has now found that um, it's very cost effective because so many people on Workman's Comp, they have injuries, they yes. become addicted to the opiates, they're putting them in treatment. And I mean into good treatment. I've worked with some Workman's Comp companies that have actually um, told me that it's, it's more cost effective for them to send someone to a good inpatient to address the addiction issue as well as the chronic pain issue and then follow it up with a year of outpatient. So if the workman's comp insurance has found this to be cost effective, why hasn't the major insurers? I, it, I don't get it. It, do, it doesn't make any sense. No. You know, but, but maybe because workman's comp isn't on Wall Street. And you, and you do a lot of um, work, I know, with, with the unions yes. and construction industry. And yes, that is a sad fact of that, being in that industry. You're going to get hurt. You, chances are you're going to get hurt in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah, you also need to work. So you need to get back there as soon as possible. So we, you know, again, it would behoove a union to do wellness checkups and, you know, teach proper form and in lifting and doing other mm -hmm. things and physical therapy and to encourage all of those things prior to getting hurt. Exactly. Well, I go into the Iron Workers Apprentice Program and I teach cl three classes a year on just that. If, you know, if you're going to get hurt, it's a matter of time. And you don't want to... And if you don't get hurt, your body's going to also yeah, hurt. Yeah, it's going to hurt because it's heavy-duty construction it's, work. It's, you're going to wrench your shoulder, pull out yes. the back, achy muscles. And what I teach them is how to treat these aches and pains and minor injuries and not-so-minor injuries without the use of narcotics and how the body inherently can heal everything. Absolutely. And opiates, short-acting opiates, will only compound the problem. And when someone is on short-acting opiates for more than two weeks, the brain um, receptors are destabilized. And now what could happen, and often does happen in long-term opiate users, is hyperalgesia which means the pain pills are actually causing the pain. It's like the gas pedal is stuck. Wow. And it keeps sending pain signals. And you keep taking more medicine. The more medicine you take, the, the more intense the signal. So we got to go in there, get the opiates out of the system, detox them, and use something to unstick the gas pedal. And in 85% of these cases, these patients have no pain. When they're off all their opiates, and we unstick the pedal with an anti, typically an anti-seizure medication, um, like a Neurontin. Oh, okay. And they have no pain. And meanwhile, doctors have been treating them for years with patchwork of opiate on top of opiate on top of opiate. But if you get to the cause of the pain, you know, so, and again, I'm a big believer in Eastern medicine, too. So, 
yoga, acupuncture, yeah. that those are meditation. Meditation. You yeah. know, you can really you have to take care of your body if it's going to last right. a long time. There are two wonderful for anyone out there who might be interested in this topic. There are two amazing authors, Dr. John Sarno, S A R N O, and Dr. Mel Pohl, P O H L, who has the most progressive chronic pain, pain management, chemical dependency rehab in the country, and that's the Las Vegas Recovery Center. Wow. Um, Google right. either one of those names, read Isn't any of their Isn't that an books. interesting place to... Isn't it, right? Yeah, to be. But right. he does amazing work out there, and he's written some phenomenal books, self-help books, because pain is 80% emotional. Yes. And 20% yes. physical. Yeah. It's, and that's a hard thing for people in pain to believe. It's a hard thing for them to swallow, but it's a fact. It is a fact, and it's a lot easier to take a pill than to face yeah. a lot of things. Right. You know, it's a lot easier to mask it, and that's what people suffering with the disease of addiction do. That's right. They're looking for a quick fix. They're looking to escape, looking to get out of their own heads. And we'll be right back after this message. do a live commercial. Hi, I'm Renee Marie, the president and founder of Renee Marie's Language of Love Foundation. I would like to personally invite you to our annual, second annual, telethon held he right here on Madhouse TV. Did you know that nearly 80% of strokes could be prevented? By knowing the signs and getting to the hospital within a four and a half hour window, you could save your life or someone's you love life or anyone's life. Strokes do not discriminate who it affects and at what time. A stroke can happen at any time and have a, play a huge impact in your life. Do you know what aphasia is? It is a result of a stroke or brain injury, which affects the ability to speak and communicate. Think about how you would feel if you cannot express yourself, even in the simplest forms. I am blessed to say that I am a stroke survivor and can humbly speak of the experience of how it feels to express myself, to not be able to express myself, and not to understand. It is devastating. Please join us Please on join March us. 20th, 2016 on Madhouse TV for our Language of Love Telethon, which supports strokes and aphasia. You can visit our website at www languageoflovetelethon.org. Together, we are lifting our voices and changing the face of strokes and aphasia around locally and around the globe. God bless you, and I'll see you on Madhouse TV on March 20th, 2016. God bless everybody. Ciao. Stretching under sedation or manipulation under anesthesia is a very gentle, very precise procedure to very slowly release any scar tissue that is formed as a result of a traumatic injury. Many people ask, how does this work? Will I get hurt? Will you stretch me too far? We only stretch the body part to its normal range of motion. After completing the post-MUA rehabilitation program, it's very common that our patients say to us, hey, I can play ball with my kid again. Hey, I can bowl again. Hey, I can enjoy hiking again. This is what makes it rewarding to us as practitioners. Welcome back to Long Island in Crisis. So, access to care. We have to get back on that bandwagon and we need to get a lot of help moving in that direction. Ideally, Pennsylvania has a law, PA 106, where if a doctor writes a prescription for rehab, the insurance company has to pay. That's the ideal. 
That's um, the ideal, and, and I know that we made uh, compromises. We did. In 2014, we made compromises. And we took, we took steps forward. Yes, we and absolutely we, we did. We got knocked back a little bit, but now we need to move forward with need, some kind of mandate. Um, I know there's a 72-hour hold that's on every very, overdose. That's it's very, very important. important. That, that has to get done. But I went to the ASAM conference two weekends ago which is the American Society of Addiction, Addiction Medicine. Medicine. Yes. It was me and several hundred doctors, one of which was our beloved Dr. Delman. But anyway, one of the things that came out at this conference I was stunned at is that hospitals, 99% of hospitals, do not have a GCMS machine. Now, what is a GCMS machine? It's a machine that you, we confirm drug testing on, all right? So you've got the, the kind of dipstick urines that you can buy right. in CVS, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what the hospitals are doing. Now, those kind of tests can't test for the synthetic opiates. It doesn't test for many of the benzos. It doesn't test for the muscle re relaxers. It doesn't test for the synthetics. So if someone's brought in to the ER in an OD, or in a seizure, or in some kind of, the reality is, is the hospital doesn't have the ability to find out what that kid ingested. I would like to get a bill on the books that every single hospital on Long Island or in New York State has a GCMS, it stands for Gas Chromatography Mass Spectrometry, that confirms, that actually breaks down the molecules in the urine. So they can say, oh, he took Oxycontin, he took Hydrocodone, these are the levels. We've got THC in these levels. We've got special K in these levels. This is what we need to do. So when these, these people are brought into the ER in an overdose, the doctors don't have their hands tied. Right. I was stunned to find out that well, hospitals don't have the ability to test for. There's a few things that need to happen in emergency rooms. All the medical personnel need to be brought up to speed on the disease of addiction Absolutely. and to teach and to, to treat the patient coming in on an overdose as a patient, not as a dirt bag. A dirt bag. Yes. And, and that's, that has to happen. They have contempt. Yes, I, they do. It's, it's not terrifying. all. So no. we're not, no, we're no, not no, criticizing, not, not judging. But enough to make it But enough to make it not a good situation. Yeah. yeah. The 72-hour hold, that what we're talking about, so that the public is familiar with it, is when someone is brought back with Narcan and all police officers and firemen and a lot of homes now that, that have a patient suffering with the disease have Narcan on hand. Brought back from an overdose, so brought back from death with the Narcan, brought to the hospital because you have to be followed up there the bill will say that they can hold them for a period of 72 hours. The family can be brought in and, and brought to the realization what their loved one has been doing and to put some time and space between the person struggling instead of them going out and getting high again because Police officers are going to the same locations and the same people are being brought back, okay. again not again. realizing what they're doing because they are not thinking correctly. They don't have, it's a suicide attempt as okay. far as I'm concerned. They don't have the cognizant ability to know that they just killed themselves. That's right. And no, are they brought don't. back. They're angry that they're not high anymore and their body is craving their substance. So if we can keep them 72 hours and the ER calls in a licensed addiction professional who they can, can do speak an assessment, to them. who can speak to them, can do an assessment, and hopefully encourage them to get help. To get help. And get them into treatment. We desperately need that. We Ideally, desperately need that. if we can't get a PA 106, possibly we can get a law like Massachusetts has where automatic 14 days inpatient rehab and the insurance company has to pay and then there's utilization after that. So if we could get every OD held for 72 hours and then into a 14 day rehab, now we've got 17 days between the drug and current and that's, 
the patient is able to begin to, to look at their situation their, differently. Yeah. yeah, but we have to start to do that because I'm tired of talking to parents that are just going yeah. through this. Even, but the, the people struggling don't want to live this life. They, they don't. don't. They don't. They are miserable. And anybody who thinks that this is a self-inflicted disease. They made wrong. one choice, one bad one, choice. One bad choice. It activated the demon in the head, and they were off and running. Yes. And it's, it's not a choice. You know, no, as I have told parents and family members when I go to speak, it's kind of like the compulsion to use, to explain it to the layperson, it's, kind of, it's similar to eating a box of x lax and then trying not to use the bathroom. Yeah. At some point, you have to use the bathroom. Yeah. And that's what it is with addicts that aren't being treated appropriately. At some point, they have to use all the willpower in the world. You can't stop it. And, you know, for everyone listening, the disease is a lifelong disease. Yes. Needs daily attention to keep it yes. in remission. It's very if you work your program, diabetes. your program will work. That's right. It works if you work it, so work it, you're worth it. Yeah. And they're all worth it. And it really is, is partying. At some point in time, we all kind of outgrow that as we, yeah. you hopefully do anyway. The ones that are hardwired don't. I know. You know, the ones you, you look at age-typical experimentation from the ages of 15 to 25, age-appropriate experimentation. And then after that, they graduate from college. They go on to get a full-time job, get into a relationship. That's when it typically falls away. For those young adults where it doesn't fall away, those are the ones that end up in the program. Yeah. You know, or end up dead. Or end up dead. You know, yeah. heroin is different in that it grabs these kids um, so strong and it brings them to levels in but such we a short period you know, of but time. But pot is not what pot used no. to be, no. period. And it's not just drinking, it's binge drinking. So we have all right. of these things going to this height always. You know, it's not, oh, we'll just take sneak it to in. the limit. You know, there'll be five of us and we're going to take three sips of a beer and, and that's right. all we got. It's, we got a bottle of vodka, and I'm going to drink this. So we have a lot of work that we're going to do. Um, you know, please, if you need to find um, Claudia's program, she has two locations in Hophog and in Syosset. She runs a phenomenal program, and her counselors are, are unbelievable. Can't say enough about her. If you need to private message the, the Facebook page, please do. We'll get all that information out there. And um, we'll, we're building into a big website, so we'll be able to bring all the shows forward to you. And I will look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week. Blessings for everyone. Till the moon, musty peak.